Hello, my name is Jan Vordau. I'm an associate professor at the Israeli School of Architecture and Urbanism at Carleton University. This is my sabbatical lecture. This lecture was supposed to be delivered earlier in the week, but due to COVID-19, it was canceled. This is therefore a new model of outreach. To record this lecture, make it available online. Without a crowd to respond to, this is a very different way of lecturing. I hope that you enjoy the work, and I thank you for taking the time to listen to my talk. I would like to start the lecture with a quick introduction and a short anecdote. Firstly, these are remarkable times, and because public lectures are such rare opportunities, uh, I hope to not only share my work, but also give a chance to tell a story of how we, I got here. The New Image of Home was a sabbatical research project started in May 2018, although the seeds for the project were planted back in 2015. My primary research interests are in architectural representation, in developing new ways to draw space in the activities that occur within architecture. My secondary interest is in the implication of digital technology on architectural ideas. The New Image of Home sought to develop a series of novel drawing techniques. To form a foundation for these drawings, it researched the evolution of the Canadian home through architectural floor plans and interior photographs from the mid-1950s to the present. To study the Canadian home, it researched all the single-family homes and small multi-unit residential projects published in the architecture magazine Canadian Architects. Over the 60-year period, there were approximately 325 projects to consider. This lecture can only share a fragment of this work, both because it is exhaustive and because it is very much a work in progress. It has been, not it has been noted by the director of the Israeli School of Architecture and Urbanism, Jill Stoner, and by my colleague and friend, Trina cooper Bolin, the irony that an exhi exhi exhibition on the Canadian home and how contemporary media configures on our image of the home cannot be visited, and that it must be viewed through the screen at home. In this way, the current condition of online learning, social distancing, and understanding the outside world is mediated through the screens runs as an extreme parallel to the concerns of the project. Over the course of the lecture, I hope to first contextualize my work through my past studies, describe the photographic research, explain the new set of drawings, and speculate on the plan analysis as to how that wor work might move forward. But before I start, I'd like to tell a small anecdote. As I mentioned, this lecture was supposed to be delivered in the architecture building on Monday. I was hoping for a foolish crowd, but more than anything, I was hoping that I could tell this story to someone who's currently visiting our school. Unfortunately, that is no longer the case. So I send this out into the ether of the internet, hoping that it finds its recipient. After that, I promise to move on to describing the research project. This lectern, although this lectern is very different, but this lectern, the idea of the lectern, is quite a special spot for me. In my first year of teaching at Carleton, I had the opportunity to thank Marion Coletti, my graduate supervisor, when he gave, came to give a talk about his incredible work. Last year, Sean Murray, another professor central to my graduate education, taught at Carleton, and I could offer my thanks. Today, I get to thank one more person. Very few people know this story, so I start my lecture with a secret. In my last year of undergraduate education, I was introduced to the Bartlett Book of Ideas. I thought the book was remarkable, and with little study or foresight, I applied to the Bartlett. Every morning I woke up at 5.30 in the morning to work on my portfolio, and after submission, I would wake up every week at 6 o'clock to call and find out if I'd been accepted. Eventually, one morning, I was told, yes, you have been accepted in the program. I was elated. I told very few people, because, but that night, when my wife and I were walking to the grocery store, I heard, yelled from across the street, hey, Bartlett boy, as three people from my graduating year were walking to go somewhere else. The news had spread like wildfire. After a couple weeks, I decided I should find out a little bit more about how the program worked. So I did a bit of reading, but something was not quite right. So I called one more time to ask a couple of questions. This is when I found out that I had applied to the wrong program, the one-year master's program instead of the two-year professional degree. The professional degree was called a graduate diploma. 
It was an honest mistake, but in my mind, it was still hugely embarrassing. The administrator said that they would have to ask Neil Spiller to take a look at my application and to call back in a week. For seven days, I waited, and nervously, I called again. However, the stars were aligned, and they told me that I'd finally been accepted into the two-year professional program. Neil has been teaching uh, at Carleton for the winter term, and so I wanted to take this opportunity uh, to speak into the microphone of my computer today uh, and to say thank you so very, very much for letting me into the, the program. That experience was transformative, and so, again, I give my heartfelt thanks. It is with this thanks that I start with a couple of Bartlett projects to contextualize my broader interests. This work was completed in the third year of my graduate program, the official MRG. So before people use this previous anecdote to question my credentials, here is the work that I completed uh, in, in that degree. In the last year of the MRG, I completed the Printed Idicules project. It was intended to develop architectural space on and through the page, and in doing so, stitch three modes of representation, writing, drawing, and models, into a singular architectural thing. The project was made up of a, a series of, of books and maps that were made, and this is one of them, entitled the Tivoli Book. So, until halfway through the year, I'd been struggling with how to design a manuscripts library, and after one particularly unfruitful tutorial, I decided I needed to dramatically reconsider how I structure the project. It was at this point that I decided not to put the books in the library, but to put the library in the books. Mezzanadine. The final project was a, a, a book that included four shelves. So this is the final project. Uh, that were 3D printed and suspended uh, the, the, the models from the text and the images of the page. So here you can see inside that book. At its core is an interest in tackling broader questions of what constitutes architectural representation and how to subvert, blend, blur its constituent parts. This interest was continued when I was appointed at Carleton University and I completed my largest drawing project, uh, Virikos, uh, up until that time. Virikos was completed with my research assistant, Aisha Sawatsky, for the 2014 International Architecture Biennale in Rotterdam. It considered what would be lost to the Dutch cultural landscape due to the effects of climate change, but this project, more than anything, was predominantly focused on the digital line. And so here, tonight, uh, I'm showing four uh, from a series of 12 digital etchings, just to set the stage and to give some understanding to my motivations for creating new sets of drawings. In the original set of 12 etchings, uh, there is one for each province in the Netherlands, uh, one e for each month of the year, and then dealing with uh, different uh, climate issues. So, as you see in this one, uh, it's the, there's a series of machines that are freezing the canal to allow people to skate on the canal. Um, this other one is dealing with warm wind, uh, winter winds, which have shifted from Spain, uh, and they should be coming from Norway. And so this is a, an air conditioner that, that cools the air. I was inspired by the beautiful landscape etchings from the 17th century, uh, and, and these two are in particular are, are by Rembrandt. And as mentioned, it was important, part of the project was to reconsider the line, uh, using digital programs to develop new etching techniques. Therefore, when looking at the drawings, it's more important to register how these drawings are a hybrid of technique. The follies are developed in Rhino and 3ds Max, with a tiny little bit of Grasshopper, and the background drawings are uh, from AutoCAD. Each line is a simple polyline, and this is very different from line making in etchings past, and very different from the typical use of AutoCAD. In that way, I hope to subvert two kinds of making. Eventually, I brought it back to the analog uh, by sending the drawings uh, through Adobe Illustrator and then to, onto uh, Haven Press Studios, which is a remarkable studio run by Mark Hershade in Brooklyn, where he etched the drawings on 300 gram arches paper using a Taka etching press. What is compelling about the Virikos line as a polyline 
and its completion on the computer is the notion of scale through zooming in and out. Each line, whether it's straight or curved, is made out of tiny segments. Because each line is the same thickness, tonality is expressed by overlapping and adjacency. The texture is made simply by line, not shading. The Vircos was exhibited first in Rotterdam, and then a year later uh, in Vienna at the Semper Depot, at the Academy of Fine Arts, and then a little while later at the, the Magazine Gallery, which was my first solo show. After the opening, uh, uh, this is uh, in the show at the Semper Depot, uh, we went for dinner and someone asked, you know, so what are you, now that the, the Vericals is done, what are you going to do next? Um, it was a miserable question because I had no clue. The issue with the Vericals was that they were follies in the landscape. And so I knew that for the next project, I had to get inside architectural space. I also knew that I wanted to shift my work to explore the dot instead of the line. But it took me years uh, to kind of come up with the idea as I really struggled to come up with the research program. Eventually, I settled on the theme of the home as a program for the new project because I felt it resonated most broadly within the profession and to a wider public. What was effective about the Virkos uh, was that the drawings had a number of ways of, of getting into it. Either people were interested in the technique or they, they recognized the place or they enjoyed the subject matter. And so I wanted that for, for the next project, for the new image of home project as well. I wanted to ensure a similar multiplicity and that the domestic space uh, seemed to be the answer to that. As it was, I knew that through the technique of, of the dot that it would actually be far more abstract than the, the Viracos was uh, for, with the line. It is from this background that I started the New Image of Home project. I was fortunate to have funding uh, for the initial stages of the work uh, by, through a, a MyTax Global Link grant, uh, which led to a Shirk Explore grant and a Shirk Exchange grant. And I had an exhibition at the Shankman Art Center, which was assisted by a City of Ottawa participation grant. And then the um, exhibition in the Lightroom Gallery uh, which is currently installed but not accessible, was made possible by the sabbatical funding uh, made available by director Jill Stoner. I'd like to start examining the research by looking at the photographic evidence of the new image of home and how this analysis was foundational for the production of the new drawings. But to step back a little bit and to, to, to explain why I have these three uh, photographs uh, on the screen, I'm, I'm very interested in the relationship of photography to architecture. In Neil Levine's article, The Template of Photography in the 19th Century Architectural Representation, he makes the argument that photography was linked to architecture through the recording and documentation of historic architectural monuments. And so these images are, are just an attempt to kind of exemplify what uh, maybe some of these monuments were. And they are photographed uh, in the mid-19th uh, century by, by Edmund Becot. What photography was not used for, as, or as Levine kind of describes uh, in this original relationship, was the depiction of contemporary buildings. And so that representational status uh, remained the purview of engraving. Uh, and so this is what makes these engravings uh, remarkably unique, because uh, it's one of the first instances of this inversion, where a photograph, which you can see on the left, uh, was used as the model for the engraving, which was completed a year later, uh, that's on the right. And so uh, this is, um, it's this oscillation that I, I, I think is really, really interesting when different technologies of, of drawing uh, start to speak to one another. And so the idea of the ph photography with the engraving uh, is, is the analog that I wanted to use for my own work, exploring the relationship of the photograph to the render and the render to other modes of representation. So this constant relationship of architectural image making to technology and the appropriation of technology and the making of, of both established and new, new modes of, of visual technique is one that I wanted to continue to explore. But before we actually move to the, the set of images, which is only one or two slides away, I, I, I promise, I'd like to make one more observation. 
and so this is again uh, something that's, that's that's very important to me as as as, as I consider architecture is, is that the the photographs um, that I examined that I analyzed um, is the is sheer lack of people and how people are often blurred or how they're put in the background or or that they are kind of uh, placed with their back towards uh, towards the viewer and how this actually in, in a curious way bears some similarity to a photographs initial limitations so the image on the the right is the the first person to be captured on film in 1838 and it was approximately 12 years and I'm going to apologize about this in advance after Joseph Nisiphor uh, Nepis uh, took the first photographic image at his estate in La Grasse. And so what I, I'm trying to do here by placing the painting of Pissarro next to the photograph is make a provocation that this is what that street scene may have actually looked like but due to the speed of movement of horses carriages and people only the person standing at the street corner is, is fixed to film. And so, in a, in, a, in a very cheeky way, I'm trying to argue that from the inception, photography was devoid of people. Uh, now it does not need to be, but in architecture, at least, uh, to capture the subject, the owner, is still as elusive as to capturing people back in 1838. That's not to say that people are not present in the photographs. And so these are two photos that were published in Canadian Architect in 1960. It's uh, the house by Jerome uh, Markson, the Goldblatt house. Uh, but it does suggest that they are photographed uh, in interior space for, is, is very different um, how, they're, how they're photographed for professional uh, architecture magazines as they are for, let's say, other uh, bodies of, of photography or art photography. And also to note that, that the way uh, that people are photographed in space has changed substantially over time. Um, so in these images, I, I, I found this, these two to be kind of remarkably compelling because here you have already a home where the antique furniture of the grand piano and, and, the, and, the, and the candelabras is, is in stark juxtaposition to the, to the modern architecture. But you also have this very bizarre relationship of, of the couple uh, in the photograph and how they address um, the, 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 the camera. And so um, this is very, very different if, if I were to compare this to a photo which was taken you know, some, some 55 years later, uh, but this is the Battle Line House where um, it's a fundamentally different approach to contemporary photography uh, where the people are typically alone uh, they're contemplative, staring out into space or undertaking a mundane task like opening a cupboard door. But they're most certainly never playing the piano and they never uh, address the viewer. And so it was very important in, in my own images and considering my own images um, that I, 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 I wanted to maintain this kind of fraught relationship with the subject, um, a subversive relationship that forced them into mundane activities but one uh, that that where they you know were were playing a were playing an obvious role as opposed to just kind of contemplatively sitting there. I started to consider how the published images um, also do not display a, a sequence of space as much anymore. Uh, so here um, they show actually remarkably little of the interior, um, and that uh, and so again that was really important in, in the way that I developed the images that they were not discrete vignettes, but that they try to, to formulate a, a sequence together uh, to kind of give a, a more of an impression of, of, of um, and to express lived experience as opposed to just spatial material interludes. In the end, I examined over 1800 photographs and with it, I recorded the seasons, the time of day and other data of, 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 of what rooms and, and, uh, and uh, if they're black and white or color. Uh, and all of this data was used to, form, to inform my own drawings. Another analysis that I undertook was to decipher all of the material objects in the image. So here is a fragment of the data set that catalogs all of the chairs, the couches, coffee tables, side tables, bean bags, antique furniture, rug, grand piano, guitar, televisions, music systems, fire accessories, wall art, indoor plants, wall clocks, 
of, of all of the 1800 photographs. So to give an indication of the size of this set, uh, this is uh, about two thirds uh, of, of the, the living room. Uh, and this was completed, uh, the set was also completed for the dining room, kitchen, bedroom, bathroom, secondary living spaces like family rooms, offices, and for the outdoors. And so it gives an incredible insight as to what was included and excluded from architectural photography. Um, but what it doesn't do is divulge why. And so I'll now take a, a couple of examples to show you the anomalies in the photographs, uh, just to give a sense of what they reveal. But again, causation remains a really, really tricky thing to determine in, in all of this analysis. So you know, uh, this, is, this is an extension of, of that data set. And so here, uh, you know, I'm, I'm looking at the technology. So in the far left image in the center, you can see a little blob uh, that's actually a telephone hanging on the wall there. Um, in, the, in the center image, you see someone working behind a laptop. In the top right image uh, on the coffee table there, you see a remote control. And in the bottom right hand image, you just see the edge of a television. And yet, in all of these cases, to see technology in the photographs is, is very, very uncommon. Um, it's also actually uncommon too from the bottom right hand image is the globe, which was actually only shown once. That's the photograph, the only globe, uh, and, and that cuckoo clock is also a, a total rarity. <laughs> More understandably is uh, just to kind of the, the chaos of everyday life um, is also not shown. Um, here I, I, I very much enjoy just seeing the bookshelf filled with uh, what I imagine to be family albums and photo books and, and kind of bric-a-brac and knickknacks and all the house plants. Um, remarkably, the two photos on the left are of the Hart Massey House uh, here in Ottawa, and then the uh, photo, uh, which is uh, second from the right, is of the Stetchison residence in Manitoba, and then the other one is of the website condominium, uh, which is also in, in Winnipeg in Manitoba. So it's, it's not hard to imagine why uh, mess or, or kind of chaos is, is, is not necessarily as, as readily shown. But what I'm arguing here is, is that it, it was in the past a bit more common and now these images are, are far more curated. So just to give a, a, an extreme example of, of the difference of these two, um, this is what uh, the contemporary image starts to look like. So here you have a living room uh, and dining room photographed by Sarah Murray of a private residence uh, by, uh, designed by Peter Cardew. And so it's the stark positioning of the furniture, the lack of art or objects anywhere, and the almost special provenance of, of the furniture, and as you see the wishbone chair and, and kind of these, these remarkably sculptural uh, uh, floor lamps. And so here, it, it really becomes architecture as set piece um, as opposed to lived in space. I also realized while looking at all of the stuff in the image was that the image was itself was changing. So what I'm trying to illustrate in this sequence of photographs and what I want to draw your attention to is how slowly the perspectival field shifts from a two point with the vanishing points outside of the field of view towards uh, one point being uh, at the side, while the second remains outside, to one being inside but oblique, to eventually the vanishing points being captured, straightened, frontal, and where they become one point, where the second uh, vanishing point removes altogether. And so um, what I think is, is really key about this is if I look at the image on the, on the left, uh, the way that the perspective is, is, is kind of pointing uh, in, in that direction, it, it alludes to space being outside of the frame, um, as opposed to uh, the, the image on the right, where the space can only be behind the viewer. And so this was a very, very important uh, idea for my own drawings, where I wanted 
the images to have some type of spatial adjacency, but I thought that the frontal photography remained important to set it up as a, as a contemporary image. So this is a, a, a further analysis of, of both the perspective and the content that's within the photograph. Um, and so, and actually for these drawings, I should thank a, a, a current MRC student in our program, Sandra Barron, for her wonderful contribution to this project, uh, because these, these drawings uh, were completed um, in Rhino and, and they, are, they are her hard work. Um, but here, what I'm showing is, is just how the, the, the perspective is constructed, the amount of material content that's in the image, and then on the diagram on the right is an overlay of all of the photographs from 2017. And so what I'm trying to illustrate here is, is how concentrated the vanishing points are to the center of the image. The next part that I, I wanted to describe, and this is a, a segue before I get to the drawings, was that I did an inventory of all of the different room names. Uh, this could be and should be a lecture unto itself, so I, I pass it only briefly, but of the 325 projects, uh, there were almost as many names uh, for interior and exterior spaces. So in this uh, diagram here, if we consider the main living space, the most common name is, is obviously the living room, but I also noted terms like great room, sitting room, formal sitting, informal sitting, upper living, lounge, relaxing, reading room or gallery, parlor, conversation area, or pit. And if you uh, expand that list to the secondary living spaces, you get um, spaces like library, studies, office, dens, studios, galleries, music rooms, and spaces like Playrooms or billiard rooms, uh, games, recreation, audiovisual, television, entertainment, and media rooms. And so, what's what's of interest uh, to me in this study is how one room might fall in and out of use, and what leads uh, one kind of to to uh, to a progression of, of of room names from TV towards entertainment to media room. And so that again is 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 what. Uh, in looking at this and, and compiling this huge catalog of images uh, and, and plans, uh, the type of information which I'm slowly in the process of, of drawing out. And just to kind of make the point, um, if you look at the first column on the left, uh, that's the living room. And so you can see how popular th that name is in comparison to the others, but still that those others are, are, are periodically used. And so we've now reached uh, the, the, the drawings. Uh, and so I should admit uh, that in this project, I struggled um, early on with the difference between the point, the, doc, the dot, and the pixel. Um, originally, I'd always wanted to create a new pixel for drawing. But as the project progressed, I realized that I was only ever working um, with dots. Oddly, in writing this lecture, uh, I wanted to show the difference. So I, I found these four images um, and put them together. And then as I started looking at the titles and what they were, I realized that none of these images are a good example. And so I kept them in the lecture because I think that they perfectly illustrate the problem at hand. So to give an example, um, the image on the left is entitled Pale, Do, Pale Blue Dot. And it shows the Earth as a point of light smaller than a pixel in a photograph taken on February 14th, 1990 by Voyager 1. And it's a, it's a record for a photograph from the Earth as it was taken almost 6 billion kilometers away. But it has the term dot in the title, um, even though I think it's a point of light and it's a point of light that's as a pixel in a photograph. So the image in the center at the top is, is uh, a study by Surat. Um, uh, Surat's work is pointillist, uh, but again, I, I consider, in, in this case, I consider them dots. Um, if I look at the image by Roy Lichtenstein, uh, they're Ben Day dots, which is sort of what I tried to do, but uh, in, in, in a way, I was, when I was doing them, I thought I was developing halftones. 
And then the only one that, that, that kind of works is the David Hockney image, uh, which is a new body of work that he's drawing on the iPad, um, where that image is, they are actually pixels, but you can't really see them because he brushes them digitally uh, uh, on a tablet. And so I kept these images in here only to say that my work lives in this brine of representation. And to develop the drawings, I had to oscillate between computational pixels, making digital dots, rendered, and today presented as pixels on the screen. And so how this kind of links back to, to the inspirations of the Virkos was that with the Virkos, I was inspired by the Dutch landscape etchings of the 17th century. And I knew very early on in the project uh, that I needed to shift from from the landscape to internal space. And so I did that in, in kind of, again, through through the medium of, of, of art history and, and, and the domestic spaces that were that were so beautifully uh, painted uh, by Johannes Vermeer. And so, and I, you know, this is this is merely a, a cursory comment, but what I think is interesting to note is, is how the, the perspectival view bears some, not not entirely, but some kind of uh, 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 parallel to, to contemporary photography. Um, I was also uh, really intrigued and interested uh, by the estrangement of, of the young uh, child, Esther, uh, in, in the painting by Christine Flug. And I, again, I, I very much liked the, the frontal view and, and how through the doorway you, you, you look outside into a completely different world. I was interested in the, the commentary and the subversion of, of Richard Hamilton's collages. And most importantly, uh, the relationship uh, of the subjects and the frontal composition of the paintings by Willem Hammershoy. Um, and so this is, um, these, these were the paintings that I used as a, as a starting point to consider my own images. So what I didn't know uh, was how to get there and how to integrate my interest in developing a new method of drawing using dots. And so the first thing that I had to do was to, to test a series of patterns and to see how they might capture an image, to see how they, they might scale. So in, in here you, you see a series of um, 12 um, different patterns that I developed and how they scale from very small dots in the bottom right hand corner to, very, to, to larger dots um, in the top left. Um, here is, is another examination and, and uh, I'll leave it on the screen a little bit longer so that you can see, but if you look at the bottom right hand corner, uh, you see that the edges are incredibly sharp and if you look at the top left hand, they, they start to become rounded, they become more filleted and soft. So the idea of how, how I can soften uh, with the dots. Um, this was also followed by uh, looking at how many dots I needed to actually register a viable image. So on the left, uh, again, you're, you're seeing an image where the first one has, has four and then 16 and then it goes to 64. And, and then just to see how many points I needed every single time to before you actually start to see uh, an image emerge. I also tried to uh, put the dots in perspective, so to, to change their orientation, depending on whether they were on the floor, ceiling, or on the walls. Um, I also tried to overlay them in such a way to see if that started to, to do something different with the image. Um, and as I became more adept at the dot, I attempted to get a range of color. Uh, what would happen if I mashed them together and overlaid them, like the image on the right? Um, I wanted to see if I could get a viable color image, which I have to admit is actually uh, incredibly difficult. Um, and I tested uh, different projection techniques, which are on the, on the left, where I built a perspective drawing in Rhino, which is very different from having a model in perspective in Rhino. So you know, these, are, these are planes that are actually constructed uh, using a vanishing point within the modeling program, and then projected a series of colored dots across the surface to see if, if, if I could get something there. 
And then, um, as you can see on the, on the right, I tried a, a series of seriographic images. Um, and this was really uh, originally, and, and I, I still have this ambition, although it's not come to pass. What I thought was so beautiful about the Virakos was that they were digital uh, drawings, line drawings that were then etched. And so I'd always had the, the, the intention of taking these dot drawings and getting them um, printed uh, through a screen printing process. But as you can also see from these screen prints, uh, I, that was not entirely successful. What I realized in doing all of this is that I had become really lazy with the nomenclature. So again, originally I wanted to design pixels, but I'd ended up designing dots. Originally the critique of the project had been photography, but I was actually, you know, working on digital modeling programs that, that, that were churning out renders. And I was trying to get representational elements uh, to do something that they're actually unable to do. And so it it became incumbent um, that I, I started to, to really take a step back and, and think a little bit, you know, uh, to try to think of what mattered, uh, to lighten also the burden of the work because I wasn't actually getting quite the results that I had intended, and to maybe ask the, the question in a, in a really playful manner, uh, you know, a dot or a pixel, what's, what's the point? You know? And so to get some distance, I, I, I took a step back and I designed a residential space that encapsulated all of the research from the photographs. I call it a space uh, and not a home because it's missing uh, some key things like a bathroom. Um, if you actually look at the bedroom, it doesn't work. The, the nightstand is currently blocking the, the door. The room is huge. Uh, the TV is floating in space. Um, and it was really designed uh, with the render camera in mind, uh, getting the spaces to be large enough to accommodate the desired field of view and, and having the rooms linked to make a, a cohesive spatial sequence uh, for, the, for the images. And this uh, was really to get back to, to, to producing some workable images. Here you see on the right, uh, a black and white render, which is then brought through uh, quite a simple grasshopper script, and that script then uh, makes makes these dots to make these dot images, and to, to, to really start to compare the fidelity between the render and the dot images to see if I could get something that, that, that was viable. So here uh, you see the, the first dot tests, the eight drawings getting printed, and what I did was that I made them all of the same image, all of the, the, the same living room. Uh, and this was so that I could actually start to compare what the effects of different dot geometries uh, were. And so here you have a, a, um, a diamond pattern. I'd kind of ask that you, you keep your eye on, on the ceiling um, as, as a place where this one actually has a, a little bit of detail in the ceiling, but in other uh, pixel geometries, it, it completely disappears. And also in the coffee table that's in the center, because those are actually two places where you can really see subtle shifts of, of what the, the geometry does. So this is a diamond. This is a rectangle where, again, the, the, the whole ceiling gets blown out. Uh, the fish scales is actually really quite good, and, and I, I'd like to point your attention to the coffee table where you start seeing just very, very light reflections and and where you actually see a ring uh, there, which is a slight divot, which is in the surface of the table. And then the star pattern, uh, which, you know, as a pattern is really, really lovely, uh, but for making drawings um, is, is somewhere, somewhere in the middle. I also started to play um, with different tones. So what this actually is, is that um, there's four different dot geometries here. Uh, and there's, there's one that, that has an enormous amount of white space uh, ranging to one that has very little white space. And so I broke the image into four uh, tonal values. And so where it's dark, it uses the one with very little white space. And where it's, where it's light, it uses the one with an enormous amount of white space so that the geometries kind of change as, as it oscillates between the, the four different tones. Here um, it's, it's filleted, so towards the corners and edges of the image, uh, the, the dots are more rounded while uh, focused on the chair, those, the, the edges are far, far more sharp. 
Um, here, uh, I projected the dots across the surface of the digital model, almost like an oversized point cloud. Uh, and so these, these dots are in perspective, and they, they reinforce the, the perspectival kind of uh, form of the space, right? As they get smaller as they get further and in, in towards the background. And uh, this one is, is variable. And so it almost looks like a scrunched up piece of newsprint flattened back down uh, on, the, on the picture plane where I have a grid. And so the, the, the points are all organized, um, but I use many, many different uh, geometries. And I also use geometries in such a way that they, they're, they're almost exonometric. So, so they, there's a little bit of, kind of three dimensionality that, that sometimes moves some of these um, pixels forward and then in other cases recedes uh, other pixels uh, away. So a way to really look at it is if you start to look in this area where you see a number of, of, of different shapes, uh, you can start to see uh, how, how the different geometries are affecting the image. With the confidence that had been built up by, by testing these different uh, geometries and these different values, tonal values, I, uh, I attempted again to, to look at the color image. So here is the, the difference between the CMYK dot and the RGB dot. Um, and then on the left is a, is a conventional half tone, the, the, the layering that happens uh, underneath is the, the the dots that I used to make the last set of images, which I'll explain at the very, very end of the lecture for the media studies. And then the, the ones below are also actually part of the media series. And these are RGB pixels. And what you're seeing here is actually the pixel pattern. Um, this is a television, and this is a tablet and laptop, and that is the pattern for an iPhone. Uh, and so those were used in some of the later images. So um, here uh, you're starting to see the CMY, CMYK panorama series. Um, it had four layers, uh, which uh, were the, the context, uh, the facade, the structure, and the furnishings. And they oscillated between the, the four colors, uh, which is cyan, magenta, yellow, and, and the K is, stands for black. And here you see them uh, getting framed for the Shankman Art Center uh, exhibition, which was in January of 2020. So each layer is translucent. It allows the texture of the other to kind of permeate through the white space. And so this was an, um, important to kind of subvert the conventional halftone image uh, by subverting the layering. And so what you see here, especially in this spot there, is you see the structure of the house kind of coming through the facade of the house with this weird cloud of, of, of furniture also trying to, to, to get through. And what I was very, what I wanted to do very carefully is to let the tree kind of grow through so that all of these dots uh, mingled together and, and it became, uh, you can still see that, that one is in front of the other, but that there's a little bit of a blurring because of course, you know, the structure is unlikely to be outside of the facade and the, and the, and the furniture is unlikely to be outside of, of the elevation. And so here, um, the reason why it's, it's panorama M and the, and the previous one was panorama C is, is that it really takes the color of the context. So in this case, the, the context is magenta and so that's, that's what the panorama is. And uh, this series went through uh, all four corners of, of the house. And so here you see the, the furnishings again uh, in cyan. That's the television, that's the credenza that sits there, uh, which, which, which um, you might be able to see in some of the interior renders. And this is where, you know, the yellow is, is, is not adequate as a color for the context. It, it completely bleeds out. Uh, but what's interesting about that is it allows the, the furniture, which is black, to really shine through and parts of the elevation which are in magenta to also shine through. And lastly, there is, is this one where, which is you know almost the complete opposite of the panorama Y because the, it's now uh, the, the context is black and so it frames very beautifully the, the house and the magenta uh, which, is, which is the furniture, this being the kitchen island 
cupboards, oven, uh, shines through uh, and, and becomes, again, that it, it bleeds through the, the, the elevation and the structure of the drawing. And so with the dot drawings established, it became time to, to reconsider the interior again and how it might comment on the photographic analysis. So how these images might address ideas of occupation, material content, and composition. So these is the, this is the living room and the, and the dining room. Uh, it, again, it became very important that even though this is frontal, uh, here you're, you're looking through that, that corner to see back into the space. Here you're looking through to go back into the to, to, to that space. So even though it's it's a very contemporary form of photography, a single point, it tries to take a little bit of, of older modes of photography by showing adjacencies and, and, and spatial sequences. Uh, this is the, the kitchen, and so that's the, the door that leads to the bedroom, uh, and that's the window of the bedroom. And then here, uh, you're actually in the bedroom and you're looking back through this courtyard space into the living room. This is a sequence that shows how I used the interior uh, render, so this daytime render, uh, brought it through Adobe Illustrator uh, using the image trace tool, and then use that to start to, to, to make a, a, a different type of drawing, um, which was a set of embroideries. Uh, and these embroideries became a counterpoint uh, to the nighttime render. So I'd always had the intention, uh, for no other reason than the fact that I just like the idea, to develop a series of diptychs. And then and by a sheer strike of luck, uh, Steve McLeod had bought a digital embroidery machine for the print and fabrication facilities at the Israeli School of Architecture and Urbanism. And I saw this machine and, and in a moment of clarity, I realized that this would be the, the thing that I needed to, to counter uh, the digital render. So here, I think is this uh, you know, remarkably compelling idea of this traditional domestic craft with all of the deeply ingrained social connotations wrapped up in those terms converted into a digital machine. And the idea of taking a digital rendering and embroidering it uh, was to me comparable to the idea, again, of taking digital drawings and either etching it or what I tried earlier uh, of taking uh, these digital drawings and, and screen printing them. And so this is how, again, the project slowly started to get back on track where it started to come to terms with the difference between the dot and the pixel um, and, and, and the, the, the kind of points and how they were being used. So in this image here, I'm showing uh, the construction of the diptych frames. And here uh, is, is Rhino in the background and the, the um, night render uh, coming through on V-Ray. And uh, here is uh, a first instance, a test of the, the two frames together. So you see um, here on the on the right, this is the embroidery of the kitchen. Here on the left uh, is is the the night render uh, that's backlit. And so, so I wanted, as I kind of described before, the diptych to deal with the the, the nomenclature confusion that I, I described before, and to, to kind of get my cake and and eat it too. So what interested me about the digital image was the distinction between the pixel and pigment that my pixel was backlit uh, while pigment was lit from a source of light in front of the picture plane. The thread as pigment is a craft that links to other traditional modes of art production, or as Luke Smith uh, describes them, you know, the, he, he writes that, that pigment uh, connects to, to painting, to prints, to drawing. And he continues uh, to say that pixels or light-based images include film, television, and video. And so again, what I thought was very interesting is that Luke Smith writes that photography can bridge the two because it's both a tangible print, a tangible print, or a, a luminous projection. And so I thought that here, this research of the photograph was able to bridge the gap between the digital render as pixel and the embroidery as pigment. And so in my in my diptychs, I have this kind of nighttime render. Uh, which is printed on glass, it's lit from behind, and the daytime embroidery, which is sewn on cotton twill, and they face each other 
um, which was a beautiful idea at the time, but became a little bit of a nightmare to hang um, because they're 15 degrees off the wall. So they, they form a very, very wide uh, V, um, but what's, what's beautiful about them when, when they are uh, finally up on the wall is that you can really become immersed because they, they slightly project out and they enclose you. The renderings and embroideries are based on the four primary spaces of the home, of course, and, and as, as you've seen already, the living room has a, a number of large windows uh, which look out onto a blurred exterior world. The nighttime render was, was where I really wanted to, to consider the, the, the larger commentary of the project. And so um, what you see here is that the light is not coming from the windows per se, but it's coming from the electronic devices such as the television, cell phone, laptops, and tablets. And, and to make the, the, the commentary that these devices are the new windows of the home. The individual that occupies the home never acknowledges the viewer. Uh, in the living room, you can see uh, the legs of the person watching television and of the person working on their laptop in the dining room. So you know that they're there, but they remain ambiguous, refusing to become subjects in the image of their own home. Lastly, the images are filled with elements that, you would that would rarely be included in contemporary architectural photography. So there's the inclusion of family photos uh, right here near the television, uh, of, of art, um, fireplace accessories, uh, there's cups on the table, there's paper uh, kind of strewn everywhere on the, t on the table, and there's toys. You can see a, a tiny little toy there, there underneath. Um, which are all anathema to the conventional depictions of the home. Um, this is how the image subverts through the inclusion of people that are not subjects, technology and daily items that clutter the reading of space, but convince the viewer of its possibility. So then this becomes uh, the, the, the counterpoint embroidery, uh, which is cropped and has removed the occupants from view and, and other than the two cups in the foreground, expresses only a minimal material content to focus on the architectural elements of the home. The dining room uh, is an extension of the living room with the person still working on the laptop. Through the window, you see freshly fallen snow placing the house in a particular season and time. From the image analysis, uh, you know, what, what was very popular up until the mid 90s was house plants. So in, in, this, in this image here, what you see is a, is a large exotic plant, which brings color to, that, the, to the corner of that room. Um, also in, in front here is, is an antique buffet with brass handles. Uh, this too in, in contemporary photography would be an anomaly where domestic interiors are photographed uh, typically uh, with, with contemporary furniture. Uh, so the reason why I, I wanted to use these antiques is that this connects the, the home not only to the present but to the past as well, uh, situating the house not as a new object of consumption but within a longer continuum of occupation. And then again, the left edge uh, is occupied by light that comes from the kitchen. So this is the living room, that's the kitchen. Uh, and in this way, the series keeps traveling through the space of the home, linking one room to another. And so this is the the embroidery of the dining room where you just see a very cropped uh, view of, of, of the chairs and, and the back door. And the, the kitchen is uh, you know, very different. In this image, it's early morning with the occupant walking away from the viewer, checking their messages as they're heading out to work. On the island is an empty pizza box from the night before and a bottle of sparkling water. There's clean dishes in the dish rack and pictures and schedules on the fridge. The foreground is occupied with a very nice, but still, it's a garbage can. In the background is the door to the bedroom, and through the living room windows on the right, you can see the bedroom window, which is the main focus of the last image. Um, you know, and this is kind of merely just a, a point of curiosity, but I thought I'd mention it anyways, that um, in the research, what was, what was kind of unique is that the kitchen is the only uh, space that's located in every published project. And it's the only one where the room name never changes. So this is not true for the dining room, uh, which can sometimes be absent, especially in, in, in smaller projects. And the living room, which as described before, can have a number of, of different names. And so that's what makes the, the kitchen very unique as a space in the home.
and here is the, the kitchen embroidery. And so again, what's interesting by taking it through a program like uh, Ad uh, Ad uh, Adobe uh, Illustrator and Image Trace is that you know, it, it takes an entire render and it breaks it down into a series of colors. And so what you start to get are these, you know, these, these, these vicious blues and these, these amazing reds. Um, and then of course, as, as, a, as an embroidery, you need to have the thread for those things. And so that's what I think is always quite compelling about transferring uh, the transfer of these images from, from one uh, form to another. The last thing that I will think uh, that I think is, is, is interesting is these steps that happen. And so you would never do those yourself if you were embroidering this by hand. But of course, the machine makes these mistakes. And it's these mistakes that, that really start to, to explain how, how each, each mode of drawings is, is different from each other. Um, and it's actually those mistakes that I covet because it's what separates the work. You know, these, these are not a, a perfect image by any means, but in some ways they're, they're also, they are because they're just so different. We've never seen uh, an interior render get embroidered before. At least I haven't uh, seen that before. The last image is the bedroom, uh, which completes the series. And it uh, looks back at the living room through the courtyard. In the courtyard, you see uh, leaves that have fallen, you know, so clearly uh, it's, it's a new season. There's some of the last summer flowers and some more misplaced toys. Uh, so there's a seasonal shift from the winter scene. Under the chair is a forgotten teddy bear and a tablet lights up a collection of medication on the nightstand. In the very right edge is a silhouette of someone sleeping. The image, like the four in the series, remain in a tight frontal one-point perspective with the horizon line and vanishing point in the center of the composition. Then the room name, um, so this is, this is also where you know, it links back because it looks back to the living room. So this is where the, 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 the last image uh, starts to, to, to connect back to the first. As opposed to kind of what makes a, a bedroom kind of compelling is that uh, as far as room names are concerned, it's the only uh, space uh, that bears the name of its kind of occupant. So it's, it's distinguished as either the master bedroom or the children's bedroom or the guest bedroom. And in terms of photography, it's, it's one of the most private and intimate rooms in the home. And so it's actually rarely photographed. <clears throat> but if it is photographed, it's, it's photographed very similar to this image as, as it's a tight crop and it only ever includes the, the edge of the bed. And, and so this is where I attempted to maintain uh, similarities to, to, to the photographic evidence that was from the magazine. Uh, and this is then the, the last embroidery uh, that, that makes up this uh, set of four, four diptychs. Um, there is one more set of drawings, but I will leave them as a way to finish the lecture. And so uh, as a last indication of the work conducted on my sabbatical, um, I will quickly pass through one last facet of the project before I end. And this is the analysis of the floor plans. So as mentioned, um, the new image of home is really three projects wrapped in one. And as it progressed, it kept growing and growing and growing. And in the end, uh, it's an analytical research project and a creative drawing project. We've already touched on the photographic analysis. Uh, we've, we've looked at uh, almost all of the drawings. Uh, and now I'll give a, a passing glance at the breadth uh, of, the, of the research that, that, that was concerned about the evolution of the floor plan. This is still very much a work in progress, and that's the reason why I, I place it kind of towards the end and I, I'm going through it a little bit faster than, than maybe I, I, I would in the future. So again, in the summer of, of 2018, my research assistant, Callan uh, Green, and I photographed and traced all 300 uh, plus projects. And what's difficult about photographing a plan is, is both the distortion of the page because of the crease uh, but also that the architects themselves have very different modes of expression. So here I'm showing you a series of, of plans, and some of them are, are really easy to trace. So like the Samard House by Roger Ostos from 1961, which you can see on the, on the left. It's quite clear. Um, but then you also have a series of plans uh, by Jerome Markson. And so this is uh, St. Field Avenue uh, from 1964. Uh, which is far more difficult uh, because it's, it's just so expressive about how uh, he, he drew the, the walls. 
And then uh, the, the one on the, the right is by Bruno Freschi, which is the Simons residence, which actually has the opposite problem. It had so much information and, and all the flooring and the different patterns made it very difficult to, to read where uh, particular um, uh, walls were, especially curtain wall glass kind of facades uh, became lost in, in, the, in, in the floor lines. Um, in some inf instances, um, you know, there's these lovely plans that you can look at. So you know, I, my, my personal favorite is this of Little Bear Lake uh, by William Grierson. Uh, it's, it's kind of just a fantastic plan drawings. Uh, but other things that were really tricky to work with were shadows, uh, where a lot of information was lost. So this is, uh, which is incredible, incredibly beautiful house by James Strassman, which is the Wittish residence of 1980. Um, Hariri Ponterini, uh, art collector's uh, residence of 2006, also is, was difficult to kind of work with, um, as were the inverted plans by uh, Brian McKay Lyons of this Messenger House 2, which you see at the top. Also, which was uh, sometimes very tricky, is, is that um, for uh, another Brian McKay Lyons project, which is uh, just this house on Nova Scotia coast from 1986, that the top floor plan was rotated 180 degrees. So as you were trying to line all of these different plans up, it didn't work, it didn't work, and then you rotated it and everything kind of fell together. Um, and it was those little things that, that really took an enormous amount of time. And why actually drawing these things has, has taken almost two years. So to give an indication of what the set looks like, I'm going to take a little bit of time to show you um, 50 of the 60 years uh, because the research is still incomplete. Um, but um, I hope that you can start to appreciate uh, yeah, the, 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 the extent of, of this drawing work. And so you get a, you know, this is, this is a kind of wonderful Filberg house that, that you see uh, right here, which is a, a beautiful project by Arthur Erickson. Uh, there again is the Simard residence that we saw earlier. Um, the wonderful work uh, by Ron Tom. Uh, but I'll have to, uh, this is the Hart Massey house. Uh, I'll, to, to get through it, I have to go a little bit quicker. Um, this is um, an incredible condominium by Arthur Erickson um, in Point Grey. But it was really exciting to, to just see all of these plans come together. Um, and what I think is, is important to note um, is, is that you know, many of these plans would remain remarkably contemporary even today. Um, and so even though an enormous amount has changed over time, uh, there's also a, a wonderful consistency that has happened through this housing set that I just think is, is, is really, really quite remarkable and incredibly beautiful to, to see so many, so many diverse ideas of, of what constitutes the Canadian home. Uh, this is the Art Collector's Residence again by Hariri Ponterini. And so what I'm able to do uh, now that I have these plans in a consistent drawing set is that I can begin to analyze how these spaces have evolved over time. And I think the first thing that's, that's really compelling is to kind of look at all of the, the formal complexity. Uh, or, and so this idea that, that let's say, um, that architectural progress, progress is in complexity is, is simply untrue. And this is only 10 years uh, from 1956 to 1967. But you just look at the sheer diversity of, 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 of the house forms um, and, and how they all overlap. And it's, it's quite remarkable, the, the diversity that you, that you get in this set. And this is true um, across the board. And so here um, I've, I've taken those, those different plans and I've placed them apart. These are not... Uh, in, in any sense to scale, they're actually all exactly the same area. And so again, this is where you start to see a, a house that would otherwise be absolutely enormous and would probably occupy this entire row uh, has been scaled down. And, and it really is just a focus on the house forms uh, to, to, to see if there's any kind of repeating types that start to happen either 
either L-shaped or, or, or C's or, or, or crosses to see if that actually permeates uh, uh, through. But as soon as you have a set like this, uh, sure, you can look at, at, at house forms, but you can also start to take a look at the evolution of architects. So you know, this is um, uh, the work of Jerome Markson, uh, Erickson, uh, Ron Tom, and, 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 um, and Fred Thornton Hollingsworth. You can start to take a look at where they are geographically. So uh, here, the 10% blue is in British Columbia, and then Alberta is 20% blue and 30% is Saskatchewan. And, and the, the obviously, I shouldn't say obviously, but it is obvious. Uh, the most common is Ontario, which is which is this 50% blue. And then of the projects of Ontario, which ones are in Toronto? Uh, of the projects that are in uh, British Columbia, which ones are from Vancouver? So you can start to take a look at specific cities. Uh, you can start to take a look at whether the houses are urban or suburban or rural. And so what you'll see in this set is, is that um, in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, a lot of the homes are suburban and then slowly uh, the, the projects become more urban. Uh, here you can start to take a look at whether they were new constructions, renovations, or additions. So actually the the annotation is incorrect because the, the new construction is, is white. And you can start to take a look at whether they're a, a family, a single family, a multi-unit, or a kind of a summer rental. And, and in the end, there were about 12 uh, different types that existed. But in this 10-year uh, sequence, there's, there's only three different ones. Um, now, it's, it's very difficult uh, to to take a look at the entire house at overall areas. And this is because a number of the houses are missing floor plans uh, for upper floors and particularly for basements. But it does allow you to analyze individual rooms. And so my, my work so far has been focused on, on the living room. But so what you see here is this kind of living room sizes. Um, and in this uh, diagram here, what you start to see is the orientation of living rooms to see if windows are predominantly to the south uh, um, and, 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 and where they're kind of placed within the home. I can start to break out all of the different kitchens to see all of the kitchen layouts and, and see how that's evolved over time. And so, you know, I think that this would be obvious for many people, but that uh, the, the kitchen used to be uh, a smaller tighter space that was enclosed and that it's, it's, it's began to open up. Um, and what I can also see is, is the adjacency diagram. So all of these triangles center, let's say in this case, the living room and then triangulate out to the dining room and to the kitchen. And it looks at the, at the distances between that. And so what is actually quite interesting about these diagrams is that it's starting to point towards that in the past, um, it was the dining room that was the mediator between the kitchen and the living room space. Uh, but as, as we go through time, uh, the, the kitchen has actually started to shift and become the mediator between the, the living space and the, and the eating space. And the reason why I'm, I'm coming to this conclusion is because what you start to see is that the distances uh, are, are changing. So. In, in this instance, what you, what you see is, is that the furthest distance is always between the living room and the kitchen, and the shorter distances are between the dining room and the living room and the dining room and the kitchen. And that's, that's shifted. So where now the shortest distances are between the kitchen and the living room and the kitchen and the dining room, and the furthest distance is between the living room and the dining room. That, that starts to indicate that somehow these spaces have started to shift within the home. And so this brings me to the very last slide uh, and to the last set of drawings. I wanted to end on what was the original intent of the project, a new way to draw architecture. And it's remarkable how one can circle an, an interest or a question, and, and I've most certainly circled that interesting question many times. Um, had I left the project at the night renders and the daytime embroideries, um, I would have been very happy, but the, the conclusion would have been that, you know, I, I have not successfully drawn with dots and that I would have, you know, had to surrender uh, to what the, the, the original intent of the project was. Um, these media images make uh, kind of explicit the relationship of digital devices in the home 
as new windows to the outside world, reflecting back a view of the room in which the device is located. As mentioned, this is a commentary of how we use media to see the world and how it reflects back on our own environment. The drawings have both draw, uh, dots and pixels. The pixels of each device are the shape and layout of the actual pixels used in a television, laptop, cell phone, and tablet, and are displayed as an RGB matrix against the black backdrop. They are placed in perspective to connect the screen of the device to a different spatial system, one that is not of uh, the flat page, but of the connected screen. The connected, uh, the, the, and that's in some ways also kind of quite beautifully the screen that connects us today through this lecture. The drawing of the room is a dot drawing similar to the panorama series made up of different uh, uh, printed dots in cyan, magenta, yellow, and black. And so the media series uh, seeks to, to kind of detail the moment of the device in the home and scale the drawing to implicate the viewer that they themselves are looking at the screen of the room in which they are themselves situated. And this is what allows these drawings to perpetually cycle through the virtualities and the real that make up our contemporary lives and that define much of our creative and architectural vocation. And so in closing, I'd like to, to finish uh, by returning to, to my playful question. A dot or pixel, you may ask, what's the point? I won't talk for very much longer, and I hope not to disappoint. For Kandinsky, it's invisible, a tiny thing of brevity. Bernard Cash is a little different and sees the point with a bit more levity. Because the line that Dinsky likes to take out for a walk is the same line Cash must use to get his lines to talk. As the point is not a single but a set along a curve, a discontinuous inflection where the point begins to swerve. Maybe Deleuze has the answer as the point networks to others, but his rhizomes weave a carpet that only points the lines that smother. So the point in all of my work is the one that grows a dot, because the drawing that I make needs a point to mark the spot. And in that very location, a little dot goes, does grow, and an image slowly emerges as more arrive and start to show. The dot is less contentious, like a halftone or bende, but the white space all around it muddles what it tries to say, because here in the space of white that surrounds our little dots, the drawing falls away and likes to hide its critical thoughts. Then we may think that our dots should be more square, to straighten out the edges till the white becomes more rare, but the problem with the pixel is that it hides more than a point, because a pixel, if it's fixed well, well, you'll lose all of the joints. And all these squares of color will all blend and merge as one, and then the dot that was a drawing will all be totally gone. And a render is a surrender to the question of the lecture, so let's get back to drawing dots and give the drawing a bit more texture. So to get back to the question, a dot or a pixel, what's the point? Well, I guess I've now concluded it's whatever that I want. Thank you very much for listening. I hope you've enjoyed the work and have a wonderful, wonderful evening. Thank you.